sort of commence with my own thoughts on the chapter, <coughs> I, I thought I would just look at the structure that we've looked at so far in First of Samuel, the studies that we've looked at in this series of Bible class. So the structure so far, and I think there are two strands that have really been brought out to us in these first seven chapters. So chapters one, two, three deal with Samuel and his life, his ministry, and his priesthood. So in chapter one, Hannah conceives Samuel. In chapter two, we have Hannah's prayer. We have Samuel's ministry, and then Eli and his sons, and that prophecy of their destruction given <coughs> to Samuel. And then we have the calling of Samuel from God in chapter three where he thinks it's Eli calling him. And then there seems to be a switch in attention in Samuel. So from chapter 4, the focus seems to go to the Ark of God. It was fetched from Shiloh and brought to the battle against the Philistines, and we know that it was taken, <coughs> leading to that phrase, the glory is now departed from Israel. And then the Ark goes on this journey around the Philistines, destroying each city as it goes in chapter 5 chapter 6 it's that glorious return to Israel and then in chapter 7 where we finished the study last time the ark of God was left in kirjath Jearim for 20 years and so just picking up initially on that first strand of Samuel which we considered in those first three chapters <coughs> Hannah said of Samuel in chapter 1 and verse 28 I have lent him to the Lord as long as he liveth he shall be lent to the Lord and he worshipped the Lord there. In chapter 2 we were told that the child did minister or serve unto the Lord before Eli the priest. But perhaps most fitting for Samuel in those opening three chapters was that he grew before the Lord. So chapter 2 verse 21, chapter 2 verse 26, chapter 3 verse 19. This was a young man in the truth who was growing. He was growing before the Lord and men we were told. And then last of all, the last time we've read of Samuel before we come to our chapter tonight was in chapter 3 and verse 20, where we read that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. And of course, in tonight's chapter, Samuel would be some 20 years older at least than when we last saw him in chapter 3. And I guess there's that lesson for us as brethren and sisters in Christ to serve and to grow in the Lord just like Samuel did. Then considering that second strand of the Ark, we saw last time, uh, through Brother Kevin, the journey of the Ark when it was brought from Shiloh to Ebenezer in the battle, to Ashdod, Gath, Ekron, Beth Shemesh, before finally going to Kerjath Jearim. As we've mentioned, in chapter 4 and verse 21, we might remember the account where Eli's daughter-in-law bears um, that son, Ichabod, who when she said... The glory is departed from Israel in verse 21 and 22. But now in chapter 7, the ark has returned to Israel. And so surely the lesson for us is as the ark, or we could say the glory, was returning to Israel, so we too should see the coming glory of Christ and his kingdom returning to the earth. And we should take the same lessons and principles that the children of Israel did in chapter 7 and apply them in our own lives. Uh, then in chapter 7, just quickly, those two verses we considered last time. The ark's in Kerjath Jearim, in the house of Abinadab. Eliezer, who means God has helped, has sanctified to keep the ark. Of course, that word keep is first used in Genesis 2, where Adam was told to dress and keep the garden. And so the lesson for us is we too should have that same care about the coming glory of Christ and guard God's word in our own life. In fact, what's interesting about that example in chapter 7 was the men of Beth Shemesh, they looked into the ark and were destroyed. But those in Kerjath Jearim, particularly Eliezer, kept the ark. He looked after it with constant care and attention. And then in verse 2, the ark was there for 20 years, and the house of Israel lamented. And I've asked the question, why were the house of Israel lamenting? The ark has returned. Why are they lamenting? Well, first of all, I said that it's the subjection that they still had from the Philistines. They were still under their rule, and there was no restoration of national worship. Uh, just as a side note, we read that they lamented 
But of course, the next time the ark moved was when David took it to Jerusalem. And we know that he rejoiced when the ark returned to him. And so I've written, there was a time of a change. And this is what we're going to consider tonight in four parts. So part one, it was the putting away of strange gods and serving the Lord in verses three to four. Part two is this gathering at Mizpah and the water offering, the fast and the confession that the people make. Part three, the Philistines and the burnt offering, but God is to deliver the people from the Philistines in verses seven to 11. And finally, the stone of Ebenezer and the enemy subdued in verses 12 to 14. So part one then, if we could just read verses three and four of first Samuel 7 and Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel saying if ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts then put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you and prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve him only and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines then the children of Israel did put away Balaam and Ashtaroth and served the Lord only so as we've mentioned, Samuel now is reintroduced back to us from that chapter 3, where he was established to be the prophet. And he says to them, if you do return, on the screen it says the NIV or the ESV says, if you are returning. <coughs> this was going to be a process that the children of Israel were going to go through to repent unto the Lord for their past failings. It's a blueprint that Samuel lays down for the people to follow. The result, I've said, is at the end of verse 4, that he will deliver them out of the hand of the Philistines. So what was this plan? Well, first of all, it was to put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among them. And so for us, we too have to remove those things that cause us to sin, those idols that we may worship in our own lives. And I guess we have our own things that take up our time in our lives. And then secondly, to prepare our hearts unto the Lord and serve him. We have to replace those idols in our lives, don't we, with the things of the truth. Serve God only and prepare our hearts to do so. So first of all, I want to look at putting away strange gods. Um, I've written what the other renderings of those words are in the concordance. But what I would really like to do is focus on events where... Other times, people have put away strange gods. And look at some of the comparisons, similarities, which happen here in chapter 7. So, for example, in our chapter tonight, in chapter 7, we have Samuel, the man who told the people to put away strange gods. He also followed that with saying, serve the Lord only. Where? Well, they were told to gather at Mizpah. The result of all this was that the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines in verse 10 and discomfited them and the action was they set up the stone of Ebenezer who means the Lord has helped. Turn with me though if you would to Genesis 35. And I think we'll find some similarities with what happens here and what happens in our reading in 1 Samuel 7. So Genesis 35 and verse 2 we read, Then Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean, and change your garments. It's exactly the same Hebrew words there. I've put in terms of serving the Lord that they were told to change their garments, to change their ways. It might be a bit tenuous, but there's a possible link there. They were told to gather in Bethel. But the result that which we read is in verse 5. The terror of God was upon the cities that were round about them, and they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. Of course, a very similar thing happened in our chapter. What was the result? Well, in verse 7, And he built there an altar and called the place El Bethel, because there God appeared unto him. And so we have these similarities from 1 Samuel 7 with Jacob here in Genesis 35. There's another allusion to this in Joshua in chapter 24. So in Joshua 24 and verse 23 we read, Now therefore, said he, put, now therefore put away, said he, the strange gods which are among you, 
and incline your heart unto the Lord God of Israel. We'll go on. And the people said unto Joshua, the Lord our God will we serve and his voice we will obey. So again, the same principles are happening. Put away gods and serve God only. They met in Shechem, we're told. And why? So Judges chapter 1 and verse 4, we then read what the result was. And Judah went up, and the Lord delivered the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand. Exactly the same thing was happening. And then back in verse 27 of Joshua 24, Joshua said unto all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness unto us. So the same thing was happening again. One more allusion then in Judges chapter 10. Judges chapter 10. And this time it's the children of Israel speaking. It's just before the account where Jephthah is introduced to deliver the people. So in verse 16 we read, And they put away the strange gods from among them, and served the Lord, and his soul was grieved for the misery of Israel. They served the Lord only. They gathered in Gilead and Mizpah, we read. But the result was that the Lord God of Israel delivered Sihon and all the people into the hand of Israel. In the next chapter, in chapter 11 and verse 21. There's two other similar allusions to where people put away those gods. It's with Asa, when his kingdom, uh, in his kingdom, when he came in and removed the idols. There he put away strange gods and commanded Judah to seek the Lord. And the other time the phrase is used is with Manasseh, where he cleansed his kingdom after his repentance. He put away strange gods and commanded Judah to serve the Lord. And so I think there's a principle here that when the individuals put away those strange gods and served the Lord, they were delivered from their surrounding enemies. And I think there's a lesson too. In Samuel, the Philistines was the enemy. And everywhere else there's the enemy in terms of the Amorites or the Ammonites used in, in, in the other chapters there. But really, what are we being delivered from? We're being delivered from sin, aren't we? And I think that's the illusion that's being brought out to us in our chapter in Samuel. Just quickly looking at prepare your heart. So this was the other thing. This was the second thing that Samuel commanded them to do. So, for example, if David prepared his heart to build a house for the ark. David asked God that the people prepare their heart unto thee and so on. But it's just that last one that I would like us to turn up to do with preparing the heart. So in Ezra, in chapter 7, please. <coughs> so in Ezra, chapter 7, and verse 10, we read, For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, and to do it, and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. So Ezra, in preparing his heart... To sort, sort the law and did it. And this is what Israel were about to do. They were to seek God and they were about to do the works to show that they were seeking him. It's following that removal of the strange gods. And I guess the lesson for us too is let us prepare our hearts like Ezra. Let us seek the word of God and let it live in our lives. Back in First Samuel 7 then. So Samuel gives the command to the house of Israel to put away. What do we read in verse 4? The first thing they did, it says they did put away and serve the Lord only. And I was trying to think to, to myself, how could I apply this as an exhortation for ourselves? Because it's very simple to read those words, isn't it? They, they put away the gods and served the Lord and they just did it. But what about for us? How do we do it? Well... We hear exhortations, don't we, on Sunday? And do we heed the messages that we hear on Sunday? I mean, midweek, later on, do we actually remember the words of the exhortation and apply those things to our hearts? Sometimes it's more difficult, isn't it, than others? Um, yeah, so how do we apply exhortations in our own lives? How do we make sure that we hear them and actually do them like the children of Israel did here in chapter 7? 
Before I move on to the second section, what were the Balaam and the Ashtaroth that they removed in verse 4? Well, the Balaam was the Phoenician deity, and the Ashtaroth was the Sidonian deity. And there's a reference in Judah, uh, in Judges chapter 2, verse 11, where the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And going down to the end, they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtaroth. We're told that they followed other gods. And again, I think there's another lesson there for us. Because in that verse in Judges chapter 2, verse 11, they followed other gods of the gods of the people that were round about them. And is that the same for us in our life? Do we serve the same gods as the world do around us? Or do we meet together and serve the one true God as they did now in Israel? So the second section, verses 5 and 6, we read, And Samuel said, Gather all Israel to Mizpah, and I will pray for you unto the Lord. And they gathered together to Mizpah, and drew water, and poured it out before the Lord, and fasted on that day, and said, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel in Mizpah. And when the Philistines heard that the children of Israel were gathered together to Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel, and when the children of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. I've gone on too far, haven't I? I apologise, but it doesn't matter. So, verse 5 and 6, we're at Mizpah. It means watchtower. It was the elevated place. It was a place which was lofty in location, around 2,000 feet above sea level. It was adapted for warlike purposes, and this was what was about to happen. The Philistines were about to come up against Israel, but Israel could see what was about to happen. Now, I want to turn, if we can, to a previous reference of this Mizpah, which is in Judges, and chapter 20 and 21, please. I've written a bit of context on the screen, but I'll just read it now as we turn to that reference. So when the Levites... It's when the Levites' concubine was raped by the men of Gibeah, the sons of Israel met at Mizpah of Benjamin when they decided to attack the men of Benjamin for the grievous sin. Do you remember when they cut the concubine up and sent her around the land in 12 parts? This was the incident here. But I want to try and notice some of the similarities of what happened here in Mizpah and what happened in our chapter, in chapter 7 of Mizpah. So first of all, verse 1. Then all the children of Israel went out, and the congregation was gathered together as one man, from Dan even to Beersheba, with the land of Gilead, unto the Lord in Mizpah. Verse 8. And all the people arose as one man. Verse 11. So all the men of Israel were gathered against the city, knit together as one man. But then adding a bit more detail to this account, verses 26 to 28 we read, Then all the children of Israel and all the people went up and came unto the house of God and wept and sat there before the Lord and fasted that day until even and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And the children of Israel inquired of the Lord for the ark of the covenant of God was there in those days. And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, stood before it in those days, saying, Shall I yet again go out to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother, or shall I cease? And the Lord said, Go up, for tomorrow I will deliver them into thine hand. So again we see that they fasted, they offered burnt offerings, and that the Lord was about to deliver them. It's the same thing that's happening in 1 Samuel 7. But what's the lesson that's being brought out to us? Well, Israel were being united, weren't they, as one. We read they were knit together as one. And I think this is what's happening in 1 Samuel 7. They were coming together in their new worship of the Lord. They were to be a close-knit community. And the obvious lessons for ourselves in the brotherhood. Are we a close-knit community? And do we help each other on our journeys towards God's kingdom? Back in 1 Samuel 7 then. The next thing they did, which is often quite a puzzling thing I suppose, is that they, they draw water out and they pour it on the ground. Why? Well, Psalm 22 likens this 
Psalm 22 is that messianic psalm, isn't it, to do with Christ, where he says, I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. So that was speaking in, in the type of Christ being poured out like water. The Lamentations reference says, Arise, cry out in the night. In the beginning of the watches, pour out thine heart like water before the face of the Lord. Lift up thy hands towards him. But perhaps the biggest clue we have as to what this pouring out of water was is in 2 Samuel 14 and verse 14. And we read on that occasion in 2 Samuel 14 that, For we must needs die, and are as water spilt on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. Neither doth God respect any persons, yet doth he devise means that is banished, he be not expelled from him. So this water spilling out is to do with the need for dying, it's to do with mortality. It was people pouring out their lives. It was on water, poured out. It couldn't be gathered up. It was linked to the people pouring out their hearts and their lives before God. And perhaps in doing so, they recognised their position of sin and realised it was their mortality that only earned them death. But of course, for us, we know that we can be saved. We are saved through the saving waters of Christ in baptism, aren't we? And it's through God that we can be saved, even though we are those mortal creatures of the dust. We also read then that they fasted. They fasted on that day. Now, I'm prepared to be corrected on this, and I'm sure there are probably accounts of where fasts have happened uh, previously. But as far as I could tell, this was only the second public fast that has happened in Scripture. Just on a separate note, Moses fasted on his, by himself in Exodus 35. He did that for the 40 days and the 40 nights. But I believe the only previous uh, occasion was in Judges chapter 20, which we've previously read in that verse 26. Um, they fasted, didn't they? And they offered burnt offerings. And I think that was the first fast proclaimed in Scripture. Again, I'm prepared to be corrected on that point. But to do with fasting... The Bible gives examples of God's people occasionally combining fasting with their prayers to stir up zeal and renew their dedication and commitment to him. Uh, for example, in Psalm 35, David writes, But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled myself with fasting, and my prayer returned into my own bosom. And so fasting was that means of getting our minds back on the reality that we as individuals are not self-sufficient. Fasting helps us to realise just how fragile we are as mortal creatures and how much we depend on the blessings of God for our survival. They said, we have sinned against the Lord. And of course this was an outward confession of sin against the Lord. They realised the sin that they had committed previously. Again, Judges chapter 10, we've read that previously. But Nehemiah chapter 9, I'll just read that reference out. It says, Now in the twenty and fourth day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and with sackcloths and earth upon them. And the seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers, just as they had separated them from strange gods, and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. So in Nehemiah, the people fasted and they separated themselves from strangers and confessed their sins. And that's Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 1. And surely we confess our sins in our baptism and we continue to confess our faults, as James says, one to one another. And of course we pray through God's forgiveness that we would be forgiven for those faults that we commit. So I think there's a bit of a process that Samuel is bringing the house of Israel through in these opening verses of chapter 7. Firstly, put away strange gods, remove those idols and the gods in our own lives, prepare your hearts and serve the Lord 
Fill our hearts and minds with God. Seek out his work and do it, like Ezra. Draw and pour out water. We should recognise our mortality, pouring out our lives before God. Fasting. We should humble ourselves and recognise that we are reliant on God and on his blessings daily. And we should confess sins. <coughs> We've done that through baptism and forgiveness of sins. And we can be healed and know we are only saved by God's grace and mercy. I just want to highlight now Samuel's role um, that's come up in this chapter. So as a, he was a prophet, wasn't he, in chapter 3 and verse 20. But we see him now as a leader in verses 1 and 5. because Verses 3 and 5, sorry, that should be. Because he tells the children of Israel to do something and they go and do it. They're clearly obeying his voice as a leader. We see him in verse 5 as someone who would offer prayer for the people. And at the end of verse 6, we see him as a judge before the people. Samuel judged the children of Israel in Mizpah. And I've just put up the reference there to chapter 4 and verse 18. Now, that was the last recorded judge. That was Eli. Eli was the last judge. Do you remember? The ark went into the battle and, the, and that person came back and told Eli the news that the ark had gone and that his sons had died. And he fell back on his neck and he broke his neck and died. And we were told that he was the judge. So when the glory departed, he was the last judge. But now Samuel, with the glory returning to Israel, was to be the judge in the earth. The third part then, verses 7 to 11. The Philistines, when the Philistines heard that the children of Israel were gathered together to Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel, and when the children of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. And the children of Israel said to Samuel, Cease not to cry unto the Lord our God for us, that he will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. And so Samuel takes a sucking lamb, and offers it for a burnt offering wholly unto the Lord. And Samuel cries unto the Lord for Israel, and the Lord hears him. And as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to the battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines, and discomfited them. And they were smitten before Israel. And the men of Israel went out of Mizpah, and pursued the Philistines, and smote them until they came unto beth -car. So quite a long section in this part, but hopefully we can still draw out a few lessons for ourselves here. We read that the Philistines went up against Israel. We then read that the children of Israel were afraid. Now this seems quite a strange thing to read, doesn't it? We've just read of all, read of all the good works that they've done. They've just repented of their actions, they're serving the Lord, but now we read that they were afraid. It seems strange that they would have this reaction. But I've put up there that it was a, a natural reaction to have. Because we remember last time, in that battle they had with the Philistines in chapter 4, when the ark was taken, they smote Israel and took the ark. The Philistines won that battle. So maybe naturally they would be afraid of the Philistines coming upon them. And so the sudden destruction... I think would bring this Philistine invasion. Can we imagine the picture of the Philistines? There's a sudden destruction of the Phoenician idols, their idols, throughout the country of Israel. And then Israel gather together, don't they, in Mizpah. They gather together and I, we can imagine that the Philistines are wondering, what's going on here? Why are the Israelites destroying our idols and gathering together in this place. Perhaps this would explain then why they would quickly gather together and come against Israel and might explain why the Israelites would be afraid of that coming invasion of the Philistines. But I think the next part of this is the key. It's their reaction in verse 8. So initially they were afraid but in verse 8 we read that they ceased not to cry unto the Lord. Let us take lessons from this account. The Philistines, they were that thorn in the side, weren't they, of Israel? 
They confronted them in battle. And it's much the same with us, isn't it? Much like the sin that doth so easily beset us. The trials of life can overtake us, and we too, like the Israelites, can become afraid and fearful, can't we, of the things that life throws up at us. Do we have enough money? Are we in the right job? Are we looking after our family correctly? Those, those natural things of life we can fear and be afraid of, like the children of Israel. But there is a remedy, isn't there? That we cease not to cry unto God. So 1 Thessalonians 5 tells us, pray without ceasing. Matthew 21, all things whatsoever ye ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. And then in James chapter 5, the effectual uh, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So let us pray for God's help and deliverance, that we too may overcome the trials in our life. Those things that we are afraid of, like the Israelites were here. Uh, one other point that I would like to make is in verse 8, they cry unto the Lord that he will save them. Again, a reference back to chapter 4, they trusted that they could save themselves by fetching the ark and that that would save them, but it didn't. And maybe this was the humbling process that the children of Israel had to go through. They had to pour out themselves and realise that it was only through God that they could be saved. And so we think of the words in Ephesians 2, where we read, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Again, we can see what Samuel was at this point. Samuel cries unto the Lord for the people. Uh, we know he answered him because in Psalm 99 we are told Moses and Aaron among his priests and Samuel among them that call upon his name, they called upon the Lord and he answered them. So we know that the Lord was answering Samuel's prayer and we know he did because he delivered them from the hand of the Philistines in verse 10 of our chapter. But Samuel offers a sucking lamb as a burnt offering. And so surely we see Samuel in that role of a high priest also. And when we think of that, surely we see Samuel as that type of Christ. We too can approach unto God in the name of Christ. As Samuel made that offering for the people, so Christ offered up himself once, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness. We have a great high priest before us who we can approach unto God through. God delivered them. And so too he has delivered us through the grace and the mercy and the deliverance of the sacrifice of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this burnt offering, well what was the burnt offering? Well we're told that it's a sucking lamb and again this is something that I would again be welcome comments and discussion on. Um, because under the law I couldn't find a reference to a sucking lamb being used as a burnt offering elsewhere in scripture. The word for sucking means milk, as we might imagine, and so it was a very young animal that he was offering. It was an animal that was still very much dependent on its mother for nourishment. And so we might see the lesson that Israel, still at this time, were very much dependent on God to deliver them, just as much as a sucking lamb is in need of her mother when it is first born. The burnt offering. What's the burnt offering in scripture? Well, in Leviticus 1 verses 1 to 17, we know that the burnt offering literally means to ascend. It was a voluntary offering. It was for atonement and it was symbolic of complete dedication. We were told that this offering was uh, given unto God wholly unto the Lord. It was a complete, perfect or an entirely consumed uh, lamb by fire. It was a complete dedication unto God, this offering. And this is what the people now had to do. They offered that burnt offering in complete dedication to their father who was about to save them. So first, the people humbled themselves 
They realised their utter dependence on God when they poured themselves out of, as water and when they descended to the ground. But then secondly, Samuel offers up that burnt offering and their cries which would ascend unto God, speaking of their renewed whole dedication. And I suppose that's a lesson for us, isn't it? We can only approach unto God with our prayers through that humility first. So first we have to humble ourselves like the people. And then in so doing, we can dedicate and rise up those prayers of thanksgiving unto God, just as Samuel was doing for the people here. And so we read, they thundered with a, God thundered with a great thunder. This was as Samuel was offering the offering itself. The battle draws nigh. We can see the Philistines perhaps coming up the hill to fight against the Israelites. But of course, God intervenes using the natural elements. And of course, when I was preparing these thoughts, we've had those thunderstorms, haven't we? Quite fittingly on Monday night, Tuesday morning. And we know the ferocious sound that thunder can throw up. And it's quite frightening. I mean, I was I, it awoke me up, certainly, and uh, ruined my sleep for the night. But, of course, this was a different frightening, wasn't it? This was God using thunder to frighten the enemy. He did it, as the ESV renders it, thundered with a mighty sound. The idea of thunder is a roar, a tremble, a trouble, or a fret. And so we can see God using those natural elements to disturb the Philistine invasion. Now, I just want to look quickly where those words are used elsewhere, that word thunder in scripture. The first use of that word thunder in scripture is in 1 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 6. So in 1 Samuel 1 and verse 6 we read, And her, which is Hannah's adversary, also provoked her sore for to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. Now that is the first rendering of the word thunder in scripture. Perhaps the second is more clear to us in chapter 2 and in verse 10, where we read, The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, we are told in that passage. And so he might again in the latter days, when the coming judgments on the earth will come. And we can imagine God using the natural elements to awaken the world to Christ and his coming kingdom. And then turn with me, if you would, to that other one, Second Samuel 22. Now, 2 Samuel 22 uh, deals with David and the enemies round about him. It's exactly the same account that's used in uh, Psalm 18. Um, exactly the same account is used of David there. So we'll just pick up a few verses. So 2 Samuel 22. Uh, just reading verse 7. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried to my God... And he did not hear my voice out of his temple. And he did hear my voice out of his temple. And my cry did enter into his ears. But in verse 14 we read that the Lord thundered from heaven and the Most High uttered his voice. He sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning and discomfited them. Same word discomfited by the way there. And the channels of the sea appeared, the foundations of the world were discovered. At the rebuking of the Lord, the blast of the breath of his nostrils, he sent from above, he took me, he drew me out of many waters, he delivered me from my strong enemy. And so as God delivered his people from the thunder with a great thunder in First Samuel 7, so with David he delivered him from the enemies round about here too, with that thunder as we've read. The great thunder, as we may imagine, was the voice, the noise or the sound. Um, the, the only other time where this expression, thundered with a great thunder in scripture, appears is in Job and chapter 37. And Job chapter 37 deals with a Elihu 
uh, speaking to Job about the elements, again, like that chapter we've just read in 2 Samuel 22. Um, it deals with the elements and how God uses his power to show forth um, his power to the enemies. So in Job chapter 37 and verse 4 and 5 we read, After it a voice roareth, he thundereth with the voice of his excellency, and he will not stay them when his voice is heard. God thundereth marvellously with his voice. Great things doeth he which we cannot comprehend. And maybe this explains to us that we can't comprehend how God uses those natural elements, but only that he does, and that he would do so in this case, and also with the Philistines in 1 Samuel 7. Great things doeth he. It's that same expression in Job as it is in 1 Samuel chapter 7. So, the children of Israel then had to do something themselves. God delivered them, but in the following verse, in verse 11, we read, the men of Israel went out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and smote them until they came to Bethkar. God had helped the children of Israel, but they still had to do their part, and surely that's the same with us. God has sent his son that we might be saved, but we can't just rely on God's saving son to save us, can we? We have to work out our own salvation with trembling and with fear. The idea of that word pursued is to persecute, to follow or to chase. The idea of smiting or to smoke them is to slay, kill or beat. Just turn with me, if you would, to those couple of references. Just Joshua chapter 10. Similar things happening again, pursuing and smiting the enemy. So Joshua 10 and verse 10, we read, And the Lord discomfited them before Israel, and slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon, and chased them along the way that goeth up to Bethor. And the same things were happening. God delivered them, but they were chasing and slaughtering the enemy about them in Joshua's time. Then again in Joshua chapter 11 and verse 8, a similar thing. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Israel, who smote them and chased them unto great Zidon, unto Misrephoth, Maim, and unto the valley of Mizpah, eastward. God would destroy, God would save, but we too have to strive with sin until we overcome it in our lives. And we do so until we come to Beth Car. It means house of pasture. We too have to strive against sin, that battle within us, until we come to the house of pasture, even to the kingdom of God. Um, I'm going to throw these up quickly. If you want to um, see them, I can send the link to this afterwards. It's just the contrast in the approach and the differences between chapter 4, where Israel lost the battle, and in chapter 7, where the Israelites won the battle. So they fought while worshipping foreign idols. They'd separate themselves from foreign idols. The Lord smote the Israelites in chapter 4. The Lord smote the Philistines in chapter 7. They trusted in the ritual of the ark to save them. God delivered them in chapter 7. They were led by those wicked priests, weren't they, in chapter 4, in Hophni and Phinehas, but they were led by the faithful priest of Samuel in chapter 7. Israel shouted with a great shout because of the ark in chapter 4. God thundered with a great thunder in chapter 7. They expected God would save them because of the ark, but in chapter 7 they pleaded with God to save them. The Philistines were afraid in chapter 4. The Israel were afraid in chapter 7. Israel was subdued in chapter 4. The Philistines were subdued in chapter 7. So, again, if you want to see them after, I'll bring them up. Um, have a word, it's fine. Part 4. As recognition and acknowledgement from Samuel that the Lord... There was recognition and acknowledgement, sorry, from Samuel that the Lord had helped and delivered them from the enemy. And I think we, too, 
you should realize that we too have been saved from the enemy, enemy again, we too should recognize the sacrificial work of Christ, that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. And of course, when we consider a stone being erected, even the stone of Ebenezer, we can't but fail to recognize the stone which the builders rejected, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is a bit of a word search, and you might not agree with what I'm about to say, um, because it's, it's more of a word search that I've been doing here, finding the original word and seeing if there are links with what happened um, with the process of erecting this stone. Um, and we'll, we'll see what happens. So Samuel takes this stone in 1 Samuel 7. He takes the stone. He sets it between Mizpah and Shen. And then he calls the name of it Ebenezer. Now I've highlighted those words, took, set it, and called. Now turn back with me if you would to Genesis chapter 2. These are the first occurrences of those words in scripture. And I wonder if there's a pattern being laid out for us here. So... Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, we read that the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden. Took being exactly the same word. Later on in Genesis, we read that in verse 21, that the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. There's two other uses in taken. Um, it's all to do with taking. He takes the rib out of the man and gives to the woman. In Genesis 2 verse 8 we read that God set uh, man in the garden of Eden. It's the same word. And then Genesis 2 and verse 23 we have the first use of the word calling. Actually that's not the first use of the word calling, I lied. God calls the day night, that's the first use. But very close to being the first is Genesis 2 verse 23 where he says, and Adam said, this is now bone of bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And so in Genesis chapter 2, God has set about helping Adam in the garden um, to form a partner. He sets him and takes that rib to form a partner to help and deliver Adam. And so we see how he would help Israel in the time of distress against the Philistines. The Lord would help Adam by providing that help for him. And so he would help Israel against the Philistines. So this is a bit tenuous so far, I agree. But with Ebenezer, when we look at the word itself, it's only used three times in scripture. Twice it's referred to as the place Ebenezer in chapter 4 verse 1 and chapter 5 verse 1 to do with the conflict with the Philistines. We just know briefly that the stone or altar was a memorial or remembrance. So this is why Samuel was setting up a stone. But Ebenezer consists of two words in the Hebrew, Eben, which means stone, and Ezer, which means help or help meet. Now, the first use of Ezer, the first use of any help, any form of help at all in Scripture, is in Genesis 2 and verse 18, where we read, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And so I wonder if this continues that thread that we're saying, that the Lord was helping Adam to produce a help meet for him. He provided that for Adam. And so too now is he working out a bride for his son, for those who overcome the flesh, who pour out their souls unto him, who repent, and to overcome that battle of sin like they did with the Philistines. Here was God preparing a people for his greater than Adam, even his son. And so the Philistines were subdued. There's references on the screen to where else in scripture the Lord subdued other nations similar to the Philistines here. Just turn with me to 1 Corinthians 15. And the point that we're going to make here is that, yes, the people were subdued, the surrounding nations were subdued or 
humbled or brought low in the time of Joshua, Judges, and Samuel, they were never completely <coughs> destroyed. And so when we think of that type again of the Lord Jesus Christ out of sin, we think of the words in 1 Corinthians verse 15, where he says, Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. And so as the Philistines were only subdued partially, and we can see a type of the end there, can't we? So in the future, Christ will put all enemies and subdue all nations under, under his rule. Just a couple more slides and I'll finish. The cities that were restored to Israel in 1 Samuel chapter 7. First of all, it was Ekron. Ekron was the first city mentioned and it means torn up by roots. And surely the Philistines or sin was torn up from their roots and removed from that place. Gath, the next place mentioned, means wine press. And surely that speaks of the fruitfulness of Israel at the time. They had uprooted, they had torn up the rooting of the Philistines from their place, and now Israel were being fruitful once again. And of course we think of the type where, the, where the, in the future, where the earth will be fruitful, fruitful in their glorifying God in the earth. And so we conclude tonight's address back in 1 Samuel chapter 7 where we just read those final words 1 Samuel 7 and verse 14 and the cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel from Ekron even unto Gath and the coast thereof did Israel deliver out of the hands of the Philistines and there was peace between Israel and the Amorites there was peace, there was prosperity. When we think of peace, surely we think of that second reference of the screen of the future age. And the work of righteousness shall be peace. And the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. And my people shall dwell peaceably in a peaceable habitation and in sure dwellings and in quiet resting places. The last point that I'm going to make in this talk is that there was peace with the Amorites. Now that seems a really strange thing to say again. The Amorites have not been mentioned at all in this account. Why are the Amorites being brought up at the end of all this? Well, as the map shows, the Philistines were on the coast on the west, and the Amorites were surrounding them on the east. The Philistines and the Amorites, between the two of them, were surrounding Israel. But the Philistines had now just been subdued by God. And we read that Israel was at peace with the Amorites. And so we can see now that picture of the quietness surrounding Israel. There was no more enemies coming about them for now. And surely again we see that greater type of the peace on earth. When there shall be no more evil in the earth. There will be peace and rest in the kingdom which we can all look forward to. And so hopefully tonight, I've, what I've tried to do is show a small cameo of the time in our lives in the truth. How we can be delivered from sin's power by God, where we humble ourselves and realise our position before him. And how that by God's good grace, we can be delivered into that coming time of everlasting peace. And so I'd like to conclude with the words of Romans 6 and verse 22, which say, But now, being made free from sin... And become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness, and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Mm -hmm.